Andrea. Well, I, I'm thrilled that this seminar webinar is taking place because I think Carignol is a much maligned grape variety. It, do you? It deserves the um, renaissance and attention it's been getting from our four speakers, four champions of Carignol, who will tell us all about them, and also four different nationalities. So I'm going to start with John Boronowski with his French wife, Nicole, runs Clos du Gravelas in saint jean de minervois their first vintage was 1999, and they have Carignan vines dating from 1911. John's frowning. I hope I'm, he's not unhappy. <laughs> and he's the founder of this organization that's done so much for Carignan, Carignan Renaissance. And he's now um, embarking on giving Muscat the same treatment. So watch this, you know, watch this space for Muscat. Then we have John Bowen, who with his wife Liz run Domaine Saint-Croix in the Corbier. And John was one of Plumpton's early students. And his first vintage, I've not made a note of. What I have made a note of was the fact that six of his 12 hectares or their 12 hectares are Carignan. And some of it dates back to 1900 and 1905. And Carignan still is uh, an important ingredient for Corbia. It's not been sort of superseded by um, Syrah, so much by Syrah as it has in places like the Peak Saint Lou. Then we get to Bernard Backhaus the German, Domaine Lanier Barak, in a small village in saint chignon He started off his wine career as a sommelier, but then decided that winemaking was what he wanted to do. So his first vintage is 2014. And he said to me when I saw him that Carignan was his absolute favorite grape variety. And he makes a wine called L'Infini, which is pure Carignan, and has plots that date from 1910, 1942. And then finally, Last but not least, Jean-Marie Rambert, who's sitting with John, waving at us. Um, and he's really one of the Carignan pioneers because his first vintage at his wine estate in Verlu, another village in saint chignon was 1996. And he makes three different Carignan, including one called Carignator. So um, over to you, starting first with John Boronowski. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to our Carignan story. Uh, we didn't start growing grapes and making wine with the idea of being champions of Carignan. It happened um, in 1999, just to have uh, grapes to work with before uh, the good grapes, which we were going to plant, started producing. My wife bought uh, a hectare, half of which was very old Carignan, 1911, and the other half, uh, Grenache Gris. Uh, when the first wines were being fermented, uh, we expected it was going to be rustic and hard and mean and big and bad and nasty. And it was more fruity, spicy and elegant. And we started asking our questions, why is it not bad? Um, that led to some research and drinking other Carignans. And we realized that a lot of growers who were trying to make really nice wines, they saw Carignan as, a, as an integral part of, of what they were doing, the, the blends that they were making, uh, and they really liked it. Um, and uh, I read an article in about uh, 2002, 2003, which said uh, there's only three good Carignans in the world and all the rest should be ripped out. Uh, and I said, it's time to, uh, to stand up and, and say, no, that's not true and that there's a lot of really good Carignan. And in 2004, July 2004, we held a, a tasting, which was called Carignan Renaissance. It was the first worldwide Carignan tasting. We had about 20 from languedoc Roussillon, uh, five from California, five from Spain, and two from, two from South Africa. And uh, it seemed that a ball started rolling. Uh, but Jean-Marie was there for the, for the first uh, Carignan tasting because he was one of the, the, the pioneers which uh, who could not invite Carignan uh, Tour to a Carignan tasting. Uh, and uh, we were really pushing for the, the, the Inao and the Appalachians to stop discriminating against Carignan, to stop treating it as a, as a bad grape variety that needed to be ripped out and replaced by Syrah. Um, and that was our a prime objective for this tasting, but uh, something which took about 15 years to happen. But very rapidly, growers started coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, my 
Carignan is my favorite grapes. Uh, we make really good wine out of it. Uh, we started doing uh, more tastings and more people started saying that Carignan is a good thing, started getting some press. And before we knew it, uh, Carignan Renaissance was making waves uh, and uh, had become an association. Um, we are now about 50 growers, but Bernard's going to talk more about that in the in the in when in his speech. Um, we had one hectare of Carignan or half a hectare of Carignan in 1999. We now have uh, three old parcels of Carignan, 1999 or uh, 1911, uh, 1974, and 1950. Uh, and we have just picked and planted or planted and picked our first young Carignan. So 2000, uh, a four-year-old Carignan was picked in 2020 uh, because while people have been admitting over the years that Carignan can be a really good grape, uh, the, the last, uh, the last uh, negative uh, um, truism is that it can only be good if it's old, if it's old Carignan. But uh, I would like to announce that uh, Carignan, young Carignan can be fantastically delicious as well. So uh, I hope, hope that sometime soon you're gonna be able to taste taste the young one and the old one. And uh, I'll pass you over to Jean-Marie to explain why Jean-Marie started <laughs> to uh, grow Carignan and started to make his uh, uh, first pure Carignan, which was called Carignan Renaissance. My, my first Carignan, Carignan Tor. Carignan Tor. Which was in the, no, 2002, my, my first vintage. Mm -hmm. It was a, uh, uh, it's a, a blend with two vintages, the mille and the mille. Okay. Yeah. And, and and why did you make a pure Carignan? Because uh, I have uh, twelve hectares of Carignan, so many many Carignan, and it was a uh, and in the for to make um, appellations, I was I was Carignan. You you don't have the the maximum is uh, forty percent flash of acid. Mm. And I have uh, sixty percent Carignan, the many many. So I'm obliged to make Carignan. And after uh, I've seen that it's uh, interesting, and uh, it was the 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 the, 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 the decennie when the the was uh, yeah, when Carignan was arrachis. Yeah, when everybody was told to rip out the Carignan. Yeah. Uh, and in Berlou, Berlou, there is there is a cooperative, big cooperative. And uh, before me, they make uh, Carignan because they have many, many Carignan. It's a, it's a wide um, village. So they, they, they keep the Carignan because it's difficult to plant and it's difficult to grow up. So it was traditional of vineyard. And what did, what did the, the, the customers say when you made your first yes. your Carignan? Uh, Which was supposed to be bad because it was Carignan and Carignan couldn't be good. The, uh, the problem was uh, that in the, the, the school and the sommelier say that the Carignan was bad and uh, in the school, they, they, they say it's bad. To teach the, to teach the yeah, sommelier. Yes, yes, it was bad. And uh, in the, after 10 years, they say it's, uh, Carignan was good. But uh, okay. at the beginning, it was not uh, simple. Mm -hmm. It's not really simple. And now how many Carignans, how many pure Carignans do you make? Two. Carignator and the carignator, light carignator. Yes, it's two. Yes. But my first carignator, carignator was a, a strong wine and very spicy because carignan could could be um, aromatic because mm. at school they they learned that the carignan was uh, rustic with no no flavor and, uh, and my first carignan was uh, something aromatic so. So it was easy to to drink. Michel Smith l l l like um, first Carignan, mm. yes. and yes, the other Carignan was the Champ, Champ de Marjolaine. Yeah. At the beginning, I, I have two Carignan, mm. Champ de Marjolaine and Carignan. Mm. And Champ, Mar Champ de Marjolaine, the tannins were very uh, sweet and easy to drink. And so uh, easy to drink. So it, it, I have a, a success. Yes. Yeah. We 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 had two Carignans for the first couple of years as well, but. We, we got a little bit more reasonable because now we have lots of other things. 
but uh, we will probably have a second Carignan because of the, the young Carignan, just to so that people can actually taste it. And we can put that truism to, to, to bed. John Bowen, do you want to talk about Carignan as a, as a, as a grape? I'd love to. Um, just a bit of background about us, uh, Domaine Saint-Croix in the Haute Corbière. So we're about halfway between Narbonne and Perpignan, up in the, the hills of the Corbière. Um, our first vintage, just to fill in with what Rosemary was saying, was 2004. Um, we started off reasonable as well, but in terms of how, how many different wines we made, but that didn't last very long. So we, we no, it's, uh, it was a good idea. We started off with one white, one rosé and two red blends. Uh, now we have a lot more of which I was just counting up. We have four pure Carignan. Um, which will go on to why in, uh, in, a, in a little while, um, sometimes five. Um, so it's, it's all got out of control. So from 11 hectares, we have six, which are old vine, uh, meaning the youngest was planted in 1930. And most of it was planted just after Philoxera in 1905 um, on limestone. Um, two or three different kinds of limestone in, in this area here. So that's uh, a bit of background about, about what we're doing here. Um, did you want to go on to talking about Cavignot itself now, or uh, did you want Bernhard to present himself? And then we'll come back. If, if we talk about Cavignot now, then, then yeah. Bernhard can, can <laughs> bring us into the, the, the okay. new, the new cool. century. Or... Yeah. Um, I don't know. Can everyone see the comments that are coming up at the same time? No. Like, for example, there's one from Patricia just now about Cavignon and limestone, um, which is an, an important thing to, to bring up because when we were setting up, um, I used to, in, in another life, make wine for other people. Um, but when, uh, when we set up for ourselves, my three prerequisites were old vine Cavignon, old vine Grenache, and limestone. So the whole thing about Cavignon and limestone is, uh, has always been super important to us. Um, because of the profile it gives. Um, the question was, well, what, the first question was, what is Cavignon? Well, I think um, probably most people who are listening are uh, certainly as well equipped to figure out the history of it and how much area there is and which part of Spain it came from and that. So I, don't, I wasn't going to really talk about that. But suffice it to say, uh, there used to be a hell of a lot of it, and now there's quite a lot of it. Um, so even, even though a lot has been, has been ripped up over the last, um, 30 odd years, it's not rare by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so it's, uh, an interesting variety. It's a particular variety, um, for a number, I was just, um, writing down a few notes earlier for a number of reasons, um, because of its character, because of the way that it is. It's uh, one of its nicknames is Bois so hard wood. Um, it's quite a, a chunky creature. It has big wood, big bunches, big leaves in general. Um, and it, it grows straight up. So it doesn't need um, trellising per se. A lot of it is on trellising, but a lot of it is also on bush vine, which is important, uh, which makes it very suited to growing in hot regions. Um, for technical reasons like sap flow being short, but also being like a little tree, it, um, it shades its own fruit, which trellising doesn't always do, which is important. Um, it's thick skinned, which makes its disease res resistance pretty good, um, apart from to powdery mildew, which is why Bernhard got up early to protect his vines and what we're about to do as well. Um, despite what a lot of people say, I reckon it's pretty easy to grow as well. It's not a capricious variety like, uh, like Pinot and I found Grenache as well and some others. Um, and it's easy to grow and also get, um, I was gonna say good volumes, significant volumes, which is probably less important for small growers like us and like the other three of you guys than it is if you're paid by the kilo and you're taken to the cooperative where um, if you don't get the volumes, you rip it up. It's very simple because you're paid by the kilo. Uh, so that, that's important as well. 
And also, I think it's uh, it's suited to a lot of different terroirs. I mean, we're on limestone, um, but not far from us. Sorry? We're on limestone. You are on Jean-Marie Schiste. Yeah, I was just going to say, just a, a kilometer and a half away from us towards the High Fitu. Uh, that's uh, pretty much all on Schiste. Down into the Roussillon, which is close as well. There's a lot of Schiste uh, down there. Um, it's not a quality thing. It's more a uh, stylistic area. Um, that's the kind of the out of doors, so the vineyard side of things. In terms of the winery, so what happens in the in the calf, uh, I don't know any other variety that is so versatile in terms of wine styles, in terms of colours. I mean, I guess probably today we'll talk more about red than about white or, or grey Cavignon, um, because it's by far the most common. Uh, but even within red, there is a huge number of different styles, different winemaking techniques uh, that can be used, uh, different forms of, uh, of maceration, of skin contact, of, of aging, and all that is linked to what kind of wine you want to produce at the end. Um, I can't think of any other variety which, is, which has such a wide, wide range. Um, just turning back to our four pure Carignans, just to give an illustration of how wide, we obviously have a red Carignan. It looks like this. So, um, and that's a single vineyard on limestone uh, with aging. Uh, it's designed for drinking for five to 25 years. Uh, in general, so it's it's uh, has a certain amount of consistent consistency to it. We also have a, a pure old vine Cavignon Rosé. We also have a late harvest Cavignon, Which and we great. also have a um, an oxidized a, a dry red Rancio. Uh, so they're four completely different styles, which is just as a as an illustration to. Um, uh, as, as to what, um, what Cavignon is capable of. And why is it capable of this? Well, obviously there's three colors to start off with. Um, it's adaptable. One of the things I was thinking, because there's still lots of it, there's a lot of different people trying their ideas, which is, which is quite cool. It's not so rare that there's only three winemakers in the world making it. So, you know, there's, there's hundreds, probably thousands of winemakers doing some fairly funky stuff because they want to. And they have the stuff to do it with, so that's, that's good. Um, its strong points, obviously, are its acidity, which is not true of just about any other southern variety or hot hot climate variety. Um, has a, a low lower pH than most other varieties as well, so that will give you greater stability in the wine, which is important. Um, it doesn't give you, or doesn't generally give you ridiculously alcoholic wines, even if you leave it on the vines for a certain amount of time. Um, as an, a comparison with Grenache, there's probably, I don't know, maybe three or four points of, of alcohol. What you bring in at 13, 5, 14 with Cavignon, you could quite easily bring in at 17, 5 for Grenache. So that's, um, as we've come away from the 90s and the kind of the super chunky wine, super extracted, super alcoholic, uh, the Cavignon is really coming into its own. Um, the key word, I know this is something that um, Mr. Bozhnovsky brought up earlier, uh, the balance question. And this is, I think, more and more become the holy grail of recent modern winemaking. Um, so over the last, particularly five years, probably more 10 years, but particularly last, last five years, people going for more balanced wines, more freshness, better drinkability. And in the South, there's not many solutions to that. And Cavignon is probably the major one. Uh, the other major one is looking at your harvest date. And the other slightly less natural options are um, bags of white crystals and, um, and hoses. But that's a whole nother thing. So in terms of, of making a balanced one, Cavignon is a great ally to have. It's superb. Um, I saw earlier there was someone um, asked a question about uh, Cavignon as a single variety or as a blend, uh, very good for both. It works really well on its own. We've been working this cuvee for almost 20 years now. Um, but probably as a preference, I would pair it with Syrah. I love Syrah Cavignon blends. 
uh, has a, it's a great um, almost complicity between the two of them. Obviously, the most common is Sir and Grenache. Um, and there's there's quite a bit of Sir or Carignan and Cabernet Sauvignon as well. Yeah, uh, both both in Provence and in Priorat. Yeah, yeah, um, and obviously in the New World. Yeah, yeah, Cab Shiraz is. Um, so yeah, so and it just has a, a whole lot of stuff going for it. And what started off out in 2004 as uh, almost a punt, you know, it's really come into its own. Um, and we're just super happy with the results that it's given year on year for these reasons. And every year you learn something different or what this or that terroir can do, or just pushing the envelope a little further. So that's probably enough on the technical stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess one of the, the worst things about Carignan now is that in 2004, there were only about 20 people in Languedoc making it. Yeah. Um, it was a pure, and now uh, there's everybody at least, at least 300. Uh, Misha Smith was, was doing a, a, a blog where I think he got up to 250 different Carignans that he tasted. So mm -hmm. um, it's, you're no longer the, 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 the genius when you walk into a, into a wine shop with a, with a bottle of Carignan. Yeah. But it's still good. Yeah, so yes, uh, is you it? Know, okay. You want to talk about uh, Carignan Renaissance and, and where Carignan is going? Who? Bernard. Yeah. Can't hear you. Mr. Backhouse. <laughs> you have, do you have your microphone on, Bernard? Yeah? He's not on mute. Uh, go in and come out again? That might be an option. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it, just to, to start off on, I think what Bernard was going to talk about, um, in 2004, Carignan Renaissance was only a tasting, and then it sort of unexpectedly became a movement. And then uh, a number of growers started pushing for it to become an association. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Bernard joined us and started becoming active pretty quickly. And what before, what now three years ago, he took over the presidency of Carignan Renaissance uh, with the, the job of making sure that things kept happening and kept getting done. Because uh, we're all we're all quite busy, and he's younger. So, uh, so in 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 the in the past several years, Carignan Renaissance has not only uh, coming back. It not only had tastings, but we've had a colloquium three times where, or four times where we had- Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, we can, welcome back. I'm back. Yeah, sorry about that. Like I said, I'm in the middle of the vineyard. <laughs> yeah, uh, hello everybody. It's, uh, my, my name is Bernard Bacchaus. Um, I'm a young winemaker in uh, AOC Saint-Chignan uh, uh, on the schist soil, saint chignan Rocobin. Um, it used to be a summer years, but uh, yeah, now um, winemaker since 2013. Um, and um, so I, I produce myself um, two, two Carignan, 100% on schist. Um, I understand John, he, he likes the, the limestone. I, I love the schist also. Uh, I think it, it mixes well with Carignan. Uh, the freshness, the minerality of the schist. It's just wonderful. Um, so, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I, in, in my times of sommelier, I really enjoyed the 100% Carignan wines already. So um, with time, uh, I, I tasted a lot of beautiful wines. So with time, I took studies again in, in viticulture and analogy. So um, 
and uh, realize some way my dream to become a winemaker. So that's done for today. And um, so I joined the Carignan Association uh, in 2015. Uh, so became a member in 2015 and then uh, invested myself uh, with my time and my passion uh, alongside uh, with the other boys. And um, in 2018, um, they decided to uh, they decided to put me as a president. So today I'm president of the, the association and um, through my passion and, uh, and, and yeah, so all that, I'll try to, to keep going this uh, beautiful association. Um, we used to have more than 80 members, um, but like, you know, all, most association is quite difficult to, to get us together because we're quite a big association uh, uh, because it goes all the Languedoc, Roussillon and uh, down to Spain. Um, so it's quite difficult for us to get together, um, but we do, we do try and we do to, to do many events around Carignan. Uh, for example, some of you probably know during uh, Millésime Bio in Montpellier, we try to do some, some offs or we do to, to do some battles against other uh, uh, grape varieties, like uh, we usually do the, the battle via uh, Grenache. Of course, every, every year we win. <laughs> um, so that's a great, great evening um, where we usually are about 20 to 30 different wine growths and we all present our 100% Carignan and that's beautiful. Uh, we do all the other things like um, we, we like to, to, to do the Carignan day. Uh, which is uh, every year or on the 27th of October, Carignan Day, where we, uh, everyone participates, participate by uh, putting up front uh, their cuvées um, at restaurants or, or wine shops. We, we try to, to make it nationally uh, in all of France and all of the world uh, through, through the social media as well um to make yeah to, to, that everyone that day opens a bottle of carignan and 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 and, and enjoys it um we're also working at the moment to, to do a new website uh unfortunately our website at the moment is is, is not uh, really up to date but we're working on that um we are active on facebook um at the moment um by posting you know uh, pictures and things like that of what we're doing in the vineyard um yeah and then we also try to organize tastings uh, we did um, different comparative tastings of limestone schist things like that um our new project like john said before we would like to 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 do um, a tasting uh, between uh, old Carignan and new Carignans. I think that would be very interesting. Um, so yeah, we, 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 tomorrow we get together and we try to keep going this beautiful um, association of Carignan Renaissance. Um, yeah, so you will hear from us. We'll hear back from us about, so follow us on, on Facebook for the moment in the, uh, Soon that the website will be back on. Well, thank you. For, thanks for listening. I, I do, yeah, do two, two, two Carignans today. Like Rosemary said, I do Infini Carignan, but I, I brought out a new cuvee called Carignan 1910 from. So I, I'm very lucky to have some very old wine from 1910, where I do a, quite a special vinification. Um, I, I'll try to. I, I saw what I can do best with this uh, grape. And um, so I do very long fermentation, very long maceration uh, with uh, pigeage also. Um, I don't know the English word for pigeage, John. Punch can you help down. me on that? Punch down? Yeah, crushing down. Um, no, no, punching down. Punching down, <laughs> okay. So um, it's quite interesting uh, profile of wine. 
Uh, it's it's quite yeah. dense, uh, very long finish, but um, through the intracellular maceration, it gets very fruity. So they, like John Bowen said before, you can do amazing stuff with, with Carignan. So yeah, thank you for listening. And I think just one one little point uh, to bring us from yeah. the beginning to to this part, this this part or the end of the present. Um, in the beginning, the idea was just to, to give uh, carry on a place where it could have its own voice. It could have its own place in in the discussion of what is what is a good wine grape. Um, after twenty years, uh, my conclusion is that we have won that war. There may be many battles uh, to come in the future, but uh, the, the war itself is won and we've moved on to another, an, yeah. another era. Where we want to make Carignan great again. <laughs> make Carignan great again. See? But it, we're, 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 we're pretty much there. So, uh, you know, I, I invite you all to taste some old Carignans, to taste some young Carignans, and uh, to, to drink as much of it as you can. Okay, thank you very much. I think there are a few questions here. One of them I know you have already answered was Heather's um, question uh, about the single variety for carrying on. The Patricia then followed up with about saying that there was some schist does work in some in California as well as limestone, but she says the wines are different. And is that due to tannin man management or does that depend on the soil or the ripeness? I don't um, know who. I've, I've tasted a lot of carrying on from, from the States. Uh, just because I've been trying to find 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 really good ones, and I, I agree that there's well, first there is difference between Carignan on schist and Carignan on limestone and Carignan on granite and gneiss and whatever else. Um, I, I've found that the Carignans there's a bigger difference between all Carignans coming stylistically out of the states yeah. from Carignans here. Um, that's much bigger than the the varietal difference or the the soil differences that we find find here. Um, you know, California wines taste like California wines, uh, mostly, though I've had a few which were more in European style. Uh, there are also, a, uh, there's a lot of Carignan in California. I think uh, it, back in the 50s, it made up like 70% of the California uh, vineyard. And, and most of that, most of what was in the Central Valley was, was, was Carignan, but I don't have exact figures on that. There's a lot less of it now though it does seem to be coming back as well. And Chile has been doing a huge push on Carignan in the last 10 years in the Mole Valley. Uh, and I've also seen some people on the comments saying that there is Carignan in Israel, there's Carignan in Israel, there's Carignan in Mexico, there's Carignan in Algeria. We've even found some Carignan in Australia. Uh, so Carignan's made its way, and Italy is, is another big, big, big place for it. So um, yeah. Carignan's pretty much everywhere where it's hot enough to grow it. And are the producers from around the world all members of that? Um, the w one Australian has suggested she'd like to be a member of our, our, our association. Um, we haven't had uh, a, a huge uh, influx of checks coming from other places. Uh, Chile has said they'd like to work with us and we've, we, three, the three of us, John Bowen and Jean-Marie and myself went to Priorat a few years back and, and we did a, we participated in a Priorat Carignan um, evening where we had a great time pouring Carignans for uh, people who came up and then drinking Carignans with each other. That was nice. Mm. Richard Lane was saying here that there was a lot of uh, Carignan Shiraz Merle, I presume, that, which was a new Grenache Shiraz, Shiraz Merlot at recent wines of chili tasting. So it's uh, obviously gaining the, ground. The, the Mole Valley has, has created a, a, a brand, a mutual brand called Vigno, uh, where they, if you want to make a pure Carignan in Mole Valley, there's some rules to follow and then you can, you can write Vigno on the label. Uh, and I don't know, maybe it's just because it's me, but I've been seeing that a lot on Instagram, even on some shelves in the States. Rosemary is asking here, do you, did you want to say, would one of you like to talk about anything about Carignan Blanc and Carignan Gris? I've got, I, I, I wanted Carignan Gris and I couldn't find any plants for it. 
And so I planted Picul green, which is fantastic, as is Tirette green. And there we're moving back a few centuries into the history of, of Languedoc before Carignan showed up in great numbers. But I haven't, I've only got like three Carignan Gris plants. I do have a third of a hectare of Carignan Blanc for now of four years. And it's, it's very good too. Mm. But I and haven't taken a lot to them from over. Is that because the pepiniuries just, I mean, they just don't sort of know about Carignan Gris. You'd have to find somebody else who's already got some to. Uh, yeah, that would be the thing, but I, I, I it's the the Chambre d'Agriculture uh, de Lourdes who has a, 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 a not a pepiniere um, a nurse uh, a nursery of old varieties a conservatory of old varieties mm. uh, and they I think they're going to have it now mm. but they were working on it when I got my I know I know Katie Jones has got some Carignan Gris I think the first time she sort of tried to register it doing her declaration de de vendange the woman at the end of the fair said. Um, Carignan Gris, I think you mean Carignan Blanc. And Katie thought, perhaps I won't argue that one. I'll just agree with her. Sort of loose line it's of good. resistance. And it's a good, it's good. Yeah. So the, thing, the thing with Carignan Gris is it wasn't, um, it wasn't written into the list of uh, official quality varieties until maybe four or five years ago. Yeah, right. So it, it was even less existent than Carignan Blanc, which itself was pretty rare. Um, I think that's right. And, and Carignan Gris, even though, just to show you, you can't always trust Wikipedia, which says there's only one hectare of Carignan Gris in the whole world. <laughs> it isn't exactly true, because there's still a, a certain amount in Russia. Um, it has been very much under the radar. So, um, hmm. well, you have the same problem with um, Grenache Gris in the Corbia, haven't you? That's, that wasn't recognized as being separate from Grenache. No, it still isn't. No, it still isn't. It still isn't. No. But we're not going to start on that though. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's true. I mean, there's a kind of, like Jean-Marie was saying with his Carignatore, it's a kind of a, a duality between what's happening and what the institutions recognize, whether it's the uh, AOC system or the uh, or the viticulture, the, the, the customs, whatever. Uh, so it's kind of a, a parallel universe. Uh, which I guess are slowly converging by the fact that you can start getting wood for planting Carignan Blanc, Carignan Gris. Um, so probably in, in five or ten years' time, it'll be like uh, a whole happy family. Progress being made. Perhaps. Gently. Yeah. I recently received, received a, 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 an article from you know, about 200 years ago uh, talking about uh, Carignan Gris. So okay. it's been for a while. Hmm? Where from? Where from? From Mark Medeviel. No, no, not from who. <laughs> I, 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 can, I, can, I can send it to you. I, I, it's no, but was it from from the lung dog, presumably? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bernard, no, no, nothing about the Karen Karen. Yeah, Bernard. well, no, I uh, myself I haven't got any, but it's true that um, we're hoping for the it's coming back. The, the, to, to not enough winemakers want to plant it, so the, the pepiniere don't, don't have it available. Uh, it's quite difficult to get, even if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, I'm noticing, because I'm part of the syndicate in saint Chignon as well, and I, I'm noticing that um, now with the climate change, we're looking into um, finding some, some cepage which are more resistant uh, to heat. And Carignan is fabulous, um, especially old vines who have a very deep root system um, are, are very um, good against uh, uh, heat, um, very resistant. And um, so more and more uh, winemakers are looking to, to replant um, cepage which are resistant. So um, all the old varieties like uh, Carignan, which would blanc or, or gray, or the old uh, terrette, Aramon, uh, this old cepage, I, I, I think we're talking again about them um, mm -hmm. because we know they, they are good. So I, I'm, I'm hoping for, and I'm, I'm seeing already some change that we might come back to that and, and, and go, go away from all the, um, yeah, easy, easy stuff. <laughs> Thank you. And Richard Lane was, I know you're talking about different styles. He was asking is, can you actually char char characterize Carignan typicity or do the varying terroirs make it too difficult to summarize? 
Is there so, a typical Carignan style? What I would say about that is that, um, all, of course, um, every winemaker does its Carignan differently. Um, there are some some words which are coming back, um, but which not always very glamorous, but um, like sometimes I've got people saying it has an, a little bit of an animal uh, style um, to it, um, but that's nothing bad about it. Um, it's quite difficult to define it, but um, it's always a thing if, if you drink a lot of it, like Syrah or whatever cepage, mono cepage you drink, you get used to it. And then you can, with time, you will find it back. Um, that's what I learned in summary, when you always uh, focus on, on one taste, one variety, you will find similarities. And then with time, you, you, you can find it back in the taste. Uh, but um, I believe that the soil makes a difference, uh, the soil and, um, and, and then the vinification as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And there's, there's a question about tannin management. Um, Carignan has more tannins than, let's say, Senso generally. But the reputation of Carignan being a big tannic monster, in my opinion, is purely uh, because Carignan is a late ripening grape variety. Uh, and in the Languedoc, where people tend to, tended to certainly and still tend to overcrop or heavily crop, uh, it's very difficult for many people to get their Carignans ripe. And then people don't wait for the Carignans to be ripe because in September it starts raining. Uh, and you can have a really nice Carignan, fruity Carignan at, 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 at 13 and a half, but it's not necessarily ripe. So you wait a week or two longer and the, the tannin management problem really disappears. And you can macerate, 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 and it never becomes a tannic beast. Um, so. Hence the proliferation of uh, carbonic maceration mm. uh, since the 80s, which is uh, basically to, what, not just with Carignan, but with any variety, and you might not agree with this, but anyhow, um, it's basically to, to cover up green tannins uh, due to heavy cropping or unripe weather um, because it, it gives a, a smoothness and a sweetness. Um, but for me, it also covers up the, uh, the provenance, the origin of the fruit as well. But I would say even, even now, certainly down in, in the Gobia where we are, it's still the received wisdom that you will a uh, whole bunch Carignan to, to the point of the, there's a project for a second level of the Appalachian where we are and the only, the only variety which has to be uh, harvested by hand is Carignan because obviously you're going to need whole bunches. So there's still very much a, um, a, a situation where, where carbonic uh, maceration is, is um, expected even though personally that's not not what we do, and it's not not what I prefer as a as a winemaker by any means. Yeah. So if if you uh, crop at reasonable levels and then you wait for it to get ripe, there is no tannin management problem with Carignan, uh, at least in my experience. Either that, or just don't lose yeah, yeah. our skins. Hmm? Oh we, yeah, we, and be gentle, that's, uh, be that's the other. Well, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the other thing that you're seeing more and more is um, what you would call kind of tisane maceration. So basically just showing showing the fruit to the tank and, and taking it out again. And so you're just getting very, very light tannins. Um, and so even if the fruit's not ripe, you're not extracting enough for that to be a problem. Well, here in the Longer Duck, uh, I, I, maybe you, you agree with me, but um, we we have low yields here, so we have, and and the nice weather, so we haven't too much of a problem of getting nice and ripe uh, grapes. Uh, to give you an idea, we, well, for myself, I I am very low yield. I'm about around the twenty hectoliters per hectare, which is very low. So usually there's no problem of uh, being nice and ripe. So no tannins problems, like you say, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we started growing the Carignan, because we were afraid of it being a rustic monster, um, we we had a an idea or a policy of, of 
to make it to 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 grow it at about 20 hectares a hectare. Um, I th I think from the last 20 years that it's possible to go more. You can go 30, you can go 40, you can go 50. But afterwards, you get on a slippery slope where you may be very ripe or uh, ripe like you need to be four out of five years or uh, seven out of eight years, but not every year. And the bigger your yields go, the more difficult it gets. And then you have to start doing things like uh, managing your tenants. But at 20, 30 hectoliters a hectare, there should be no problem as long as you take good care of the grapes. I think it's a, it's a recurring question that's uh, happening not just <laughs> Uh, not just with uh, with Cahill, but with any variety, and particularly down here, is um, is wine making styles, and that's that's changed a lot over the last five ten years, and certainly over the last twenty years. So uh, it's it's not so bad to have to pay attention to your tannins and actually ask yourself a few questions while you're while you're vinifying, even if it's your thirty fifth harvest or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Do you do educational? talks to your fellow members about how to manage Carignan or do you all do, you, do all the people that you accept know how to manage Carignan? I'm not yeah, sure educational it. talks is, is quite a thing to say, is it? Well, no, I mean, sorry, just talking. We, we get all the, all the local managers here and tell them how to, how to do it. No. No, um, <sighs> no we talk, we just, talk. You do? No, we talk between us to help yeah. we, to help out each other. But no, we wouldn't never say uh, anyone how to do the carignol stuff. No, 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 no. Is there a view as whether carignol is better aged in oak or aged in vats? Yeah, no. Both. Or both. Blend both. What do you want to do? What do you want to make? Yeah. It can be really good in tank. It can be mm. really good in jars, uh, amphora. Eggs, yeah. Mm. It's a variety. And there's a question here from uh, Abby who was saying, uh, is there any links with chili producers through the uh, movement of um, independent growers? What's the movement of independent growers? The movie. The Vignon Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's French. Um, um, I'm not part of it anymore. No, and I, I, not as far as I'm aware. But there, there might be. I'd be surprised. I mean, we we had well, an idea to do uh, uh, some collaborative worldwide tastings with uh, with pre route or with Chile, and uh, it just those kind of things take a lot of time, and the the returns on our side are actually quite uh, limited and personal. So it hasn't happened. If anybody wants to organize it, we'll all come. <laughs> if the circle of wine writers yeah, yeah. wants to organize a world Carignan tasting, name your city, we'll come. There, there is actually, I think, uh, with the Vigneron Independent, there is um, another, it's not an association, but I, there is um, a concours with um, medals about the best Carignan, but we didn't want to take part of that because um, it's not what we're looking for to do to, to co no competition between us it's ever it's just about carrying on and not who makes the best car so we didn't take part of that but it does exist a concours of uh, the best car in the dog okay abby was just saying that what she, what she's really saying was to the do you talk much to the chili producers as there's so much going on there really that's what had the Oh, okay. the question. They're, they're very far away. Um, okay. If they want to come over for dinner, they're welcome. <laughs> or vice versa. I, yeah. <laughs> if they want to in invite us over for dinner, we'll come. We went to Priya It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Mm. Let's go back. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know if there's anybody else has any other questions. I think that's gone through the ones that were here. Right. Shall I wind up by thanking you? So everybody? yes, thank you, Rosemary. Well, th well, thank you. Lovely to have four people giving us the you know, enthusiastic presentation, you know, the trials and tribulations and joys of producing carignol.
it's been a, a great a great session thank you so much